Hey, it's Dr. Osborne. Welcome tonight for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We are specially broadcasting tonight. It is a Tuesday. We took our Monday off. So happy belated Memorial Day for those of you um, from yesterday who, who tuned in and didn't find us on the air. So again, a special broadcast for Tuesday night on the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. So before we jump in, uh, a little bit of housekeeping here. want to make sure that my speakers are coming in loud and clear for you live. So let me know, chime in, let me know that I'm coming in loud and clear for you. And uh, let me know where you're from in the world too. I'd like to know um, where you're tuning in from in the world. So let me know if you can hear me. Let me know um, where you're from and we'll get rolling into tonight's topic Uh Tonight's topic is, is one near and dear to my heart. It's one that so many people are confused about. It's about cholesterol. Um, cholesterol has been like the redheaded stepchild of the medical world, meaning that everybody, uh, everybody hates it. And everybody tries to kill it, lower it, crush it. Uh, everybody tries to medicate it into the ground, regardless of the fact of how important it is. And so we're going to be diving into statistics and numbers and research studies and facts about cholesterol this evening to help you be able to make some better and more intelligent decisions about whether or not cholesterol needs to be lowered or whether or not it needs to be left alone. So again, as, uh, as we're getting ready to begin, chime in, let me know that you can hear me and let me know where you're coming from in the world and we will get right into this uh right into this show tonight all righty let's see here looks like my speakers are coming in loud and clear we've got victoria from australia misty's tuning in maxine uh can hear me just fine all right so let's dive in i'm going to go ahead and get started those of you who are just coming in Again, let me know. Let me know where you're from. Let me know um, that you can hear me. It looks like we got Lynn from South Australia. Also, if you know somebody who will benefit from tonight's show, make sure you um, share this in their feed, um, either through uh, through the link, the share link button, uh, whether you're on Facebook or whether you're on YouTube. And uh, you know, make sure too if you're not already subscribed to our uh, to our archived feeds of the Pig Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. You can do that over at Glutenology. That's youtube.com forward slash Glutenology. You can also subscribe to our newsletter, glutenfreesociety.org. We'll send you a bunch of really great free information that might help you on your journey back to health. So let's dive in. Is cholesterol evil? Uh, no, let's talk about some of the functions of cholesterol. One of the most important functions of cholesterol is that it actually serves as a precursor to all of your sex steroids. So what does that really mean? Sex steroids, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. You can't make those hormones without cholesterol. Cholesterol is kind of the base. It's the basis or the backbone for those hormones. So this is one of the reasons why we are chronically seeing people uh, coming in with, uh, rather, let me rephrase that. If you look around, you're seeing all of these low T centers popping up all over you know, different cities, depending on where you live. But these are very, very common in most metropolitan areas in the United States, these low T centers. And, and this is as a, really as a direct result of treating and lowering cholesterol unabashedly for the past 30 plus years, we're now seeing the effect that it has on hormone levels. And for men particularly, they're typically the biggest victim in this, um, in this whole ordeal because men are, uh, are the ones that tend to have higher rates of heart disease. And so they're the ones that have doctors that go most aggressively after their cholesterol levels. So the low T centers that you see popping up all around, in a large part, I'm not saying that cholesterol lowering drugs are the only reason why we're seeing that, but it's a very, very big reason why we're seeing uh, why we're seeing uh, these centers popping up to treat now a created problem as a result of of lowering cholesterol. We're actually lowering testosterone again, creating a secondary problem that needs to be treated. Um, so low T is a big part of it. 
And then again, cholesterol is a precursor, aside from your sex steroids, cholesterol is a precursor, in essence, you need it to make vitamin D. So there's a type of cholesterol in your skin called C7-dehydrocholesterol. And when sunlight or UV light hits the skin, that cholesterol in your skin, embedded in your skin, is actually converted into vitamin D. Uh, and then subsequently goes both to the liver and the kidney where it's converted into the active metabolites of vitamin D. So very, very important function. If we're blocking cholesterol, we actually inhibit the body's process of naturally being able to produce vitamin D from sunshine. Now, in the last 20 years, we've seen epidemic vitamin D deficiency levels. And uh, is this another one of the potential possibilities very much? So as a result of, again, cholesterol blocking your capacity to generate vitamin D. Let's see here. Charlene from Southeast Texas. Pamela is chiming in. Wendy from Glasgow, UK. Uh, Maxine from Winbur, Pennsylvania. Again, if you're just tuning in, let me know where you're from in the world. Um, like to like to know who I'm talking to uh, when uh, we're on the air live. And if you've got questions, go ahead and fire away. We're going to get to as many of those as we can before the end of the evening. So again, if you've got questions and you want to know uh, anything, tonight's all about cholesterol. So anything you've got a question about cholesterol, go ahead and type that in and I'll get to those ASAP. So again, as we were saying, cholesterol is a precursor to vitamin D. You've got a type of cholesterol in your skin that when sunlight hits it is converted into, uh, is converted into vitamin D. Now, one of the other, one of the other things, and I'm going to show you an image here in just a minute, but one of the other things that's very important that cholesterol produces in your body is a substance or precursor to a substance called coenzyme Q10. You may have heard of CoQ10 before. It's a common over-the-counter supplement. A lot of people take it. CoQ10 is like a B vitamin, although your body can produce it. So unlike a B vitamin, which you have to eat, you have to obtain from food, your body can actually synthesize CoQ10 from cholesterol, but not when you block the production of cholesterol. And that's what statin medications do. So these drugs that block cholesterol, they're called HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, actually block cholesterol formation. And again, cholesterol being a precursor to CoQ10 makes it very hard for your body to be able to produce CoQ10. Uh, let's see here. I don't know how to pronounce this name, but I'm going to give it a go. Wonga Lawit from Toronto, Canada. Uh, welcome this evening. Uh, Tony Carter and uh, Habiba from California, from San Diego, and Charlene from Southeast Texas. Welcome to the show tonight. Again, if you're just tuning in, make sure you share this uh, with somebody in your feed who might need some benefit or could benefit from this information and uh, in fire away with your questions. Again, we're going to get to those as quickly as we can this evening, get as many answered as possible. So we said so far, we said that, that, you know, cholesterol, why is it, why is it not evil, right? We said that cholesterol is a precursor to all sex steroids, including testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. Cholesterol helps your body produce vitamin D and cholesterol is necessary to make an energetic substance called CoQ10. Now, CoQ10 deficiency causes muscle pain. For many people with statin on statin medications, they end up with severe muscle pain as a result of causing CoQ10 deficiency. So it can cause muscle pain, muscle atrophy, that's the muscle shrinking, and it can also cause increased blood pressure. So Remember, why do doctors prescribe statins in the first place? It's to lower cholesterol. But why do we want to lower cholesterol? Well, the saying goes that lowering cholesterol reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, and that's why it's being done. Well, if I give you a medication or your doctor gives you a medication that actually inhibits a nutrient, in this case CoQ10, and the deficiency of that nutrient causes high blood pressure, what are we doing to your risk for developing heart disease? You, you follow the, the trend here. So, you know, you can't say we're going to lower your risk in one way, but then create a new risk in another way. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And this is one of the reasons why the past 30 plus years of statin use in this country has not led to a reduction in mortality rates or reduction in the incidence of, of heart disease. It's actually, we have more heart disease than we've ever had. We have more people dying from heart disease than we ever have, despite our aggressive attempts at lowering cholesterol for the last number of years. So, very important that you understand that by taking cholesterol-lowering medications, you block vitamin D, 
you, you inhibit CoQ10. CoQ10 deficiency causes high blood pressure. High blood pressure increases your risk for heart disease. It doesn't reduce your risk for heart disease. Now, the other thing CoQ10 deficiency causes is congestive heart failure. And this is commonly manifested, you know, before it gets diagnosed in, with swelling of the feet. In essence, the sweet, the, the sweet, the feet will begin to swell. And as they swell up, you'll have developed, you can develop something called edema or pitting edema, which is when you grab the ankles, you leave a watermark indentation in the flesh. That's pitting edema. And uh, again, CoQ10 deficiency can cause pitting edema and statin medications can lower CoQ10. So we can create, again, we can create different forms of heart disease under the guise of trying to reduce the risk of heart disease. So it's very important that you understand that and know that. So CoQ10 deficiency, again, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure. Now I'm going to back up for a minute. We were talking uh, earlier about vitamin D deficiency. And so I think it's fair to, um, to chime in about vitamin D deficiency and what happens with a vitamin D deficiency as it relates to heart disease. Because remember, the whole point of lowering cholesterol is to reduce the risk of heart disease, not to increase it. But by creating vitamin D deficiency, understand that vitamin D deficiency can also cause high blood pressure. Vitamin D deficiency can also cause muscle loss. Vitamin D deficiency can also contribute to kidney dysfunction, which is linked to high blood pressure. So we've got multiple mechanisms at work here where, where creating a vitamin D deficiency or contributing to a vitamin D deficiency can actually, again, increase the risk for developing the disease this purported to, that is purported that the doctor is trying to reduce the risk for. So sometimes, again, the treatment creates a problem that, that, uh, that leads to an increased risk in other ways. And you don't want to be, um, you don't want to be victim to that process. Now, one of the other things I think I should point out about why cholesterol is not evil is that cholesterol is actually a, it's a substance, it's a fatty protein, it's a, it's a mixture, it's lipoprotein is actually the proper term, but it's a mixture of fat and protein. And what cholesterol does is it carries nutrients through the bloodstream. So that's one of its other functions. It actually carries several of your antioxidants through your bloodstream, helping protect your tissues and so very, very important for that function. One of the other functions of cholesterol is it's actually a natural antiviral and a an natural antibacterial. And so it can actually help your body fight infection. So one of the things that we actually see, uh, this is actually quite a common scenario where people go to their doctor, they get their cholesterol measured. They're in the process of fighting a cold or a flu or some other type of, of issue. And that's actually why they went to the doctor because they were feeling under the weather. They get their cholesterol, excuse me, they get their cholesterol measured. Doc says your cholesterol is high and then they put them on medication. When in essence, the reason the cholesterol, sometimes the reason the cholesterol is higher is because the person is trying to fight an infection and that cholesterol is helping the body to do that. So again, you don't necessarily need to uh, jump to the gun or jump to the suppression of the cholesterol, especially if you've gone to the doctor and you were struggling with overcoming a cold or a flu or some other type of infectious illness where your cholesterol might be high as a result of your body using that cholesterol as an antibacterial or antiviral. So again, understand that cholesterol serves that function as well. Another very important function. Now, one more function that we'll throw in there is that cholesterol is necessary. It's actually won a Nobel Prize. Very few people realize this, but LDL, which is bad cholesterol, won a Nobel Prize in medicine for being discovered to be the rate limiting ingredient necessary to form brain synapses. So drum roll, what does that mean? It means if your body is going to properly be able, if your brain is going to properly be able to create communication junctions from one brain cell to the next, you actually need bad cholesterol to do that. You need LDL, the bad cholesterol. That's again, that's the one that most doctors attack. It's the LDL, the low, den low density lipoprotein, LDL um, for short, is oftentimes attacked with, with these statin medications. And you need LDL to form brain synapses, to form the junctions, the neuronal junctions between your brain cells and neurological cells. So again, cholesterol, very, very important molecule. In summary, we need cholesterol for brain synapses. We need cholesterol to fight infection. We need cholesterol to make CoQ10 and vitamin D. We need cholesterol to carry our antioxidants through our bloodstream. We need cholesterol to form 
sex, steroids like estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. So how can cholesterol be evil if it's necessary to do all of those things? Newsflash is that it's not evil. And again, that's why I wanted to start this conversation off tonight with that premise, with you understanding all the important functions of what cholesterol does. As a matter of fact, there was a research study published, oh, it was over a decade ago now, where cholesterol below 150, and a lot of doctors aggressively go after cholesterol, where this study actually showed that cholesterol less than 150 actually creates a tendency toward depression and increases suicidal thoughts in the people whose cholesterol are actually being artificially suppressed to that level. So this goes back to cholesterol's function in the brain and how it's important to form neuronal synapses. So again, we're starting tonight's show because many of you are just tuning in. I can see the, the attendance as it's going up. As many of you are just chiming in, the email carrier that sent out the notice must have gotten that into your e inbox late. We're starting out from the premise tonight that Cholesterol, high cholesterol is not bad. High cholesterol is a myth. And that let's preface that by saying, what do I mean by high cholesterol? Because I think, I think a, a, at least from a historical perspective, we need to really, you know, let's define what high cholesterol is. Well, if we look at where cholesterol began, what used to be high cholesterol versus what today is considered to be high cholesterol Years ago, high cholesterol was considered to be 250 plus. And uh, what happened, there was, a, there was actually a panel. It was 13 doctors that formed this panel. Nine of them were directly on the payroll for Merck and Pfizer. These are two big drug companies that produce Crestor, or not Crestor, but Lipitor and Zocor, the two brand name statin medications. Nine of these doctors were on the payroll directly for these companies. And the FDA, instead of saying these doctors can't sit on this panel, the FDA came back and said, no, you can sit on this panel. We're going to issue you a waiver because we still consider you to be an expert, even though you're on this panel, even though you're being paid directly by these pharmaceutical companies who have a direct tie to profits if you make a decision about what high cholesterol actually means. So this panel created a, a perception that cholesterol, anything over 220 was going to be considered high. And then years later, another panel formed. This was a panel of four doctors. And uh, and these doctors, all on the payroll for Merck and Pfizer, also received waivers of conflict of interest to lower the normal standard of 220 down to 200. And so over the past uh, 40 years or so, we've seen the norm drop from 250 to 200. And we've seen that norm drop based on the decision of doctors who were directly being paid by drug industry who had direct ties to profits from the from these numbers being coming back as lower. So in essence, a lot of what we consider to be high cholesterol is perception and not reality, meaning that that the numbers were were actually dropped in, in order. And again, um, these numbers were dropped in order to increase the quantity of people who could be medicated with cholesterol lowering drugs less than they were decreased because the research showed that higher cholesterol above 250 played a huge role in, uh, in actually creating or, or contributing to heart disease. And I'm going to show you one study here, and I'm going to pump this into the feed. So if you're interested in research, you can actually go and read more about it. But in this particular study, what's interesting about this is that what it found is that cholesterol in, increases mortality, meaning that people live longer with higher cholesterol. So I'm going to put that study into the link. And if you want to go back and you want to look at that, it's it's a National Library of Medicine. That study was published um, showing that people with, with that live longer actually had higher cholesterol, not lower cholesterol. And that's, you know, that's something that your doctor probably won't talk to you about is why people as they get older tend to live longer if their cholesterol is higher. And one of the reasons why we think that happens is because it helps them fight infection and it helps with their antioxidant status. And remember, that a premature aging and early aging actually result as a result of DNA breakdown. And one of the things that protects our DNA from early breakdown is antioxidants. And if cholesterol is an antioxidant carrier and we're suppressing it, what is that doing to our longevity? Uh, good question. So again, don't, uh, I want you to understand that the premise of tonight's show is not really, we're not tr talking tonight to demonize cholesterol. We're not talking tonight about how you can lower your cholesterol naturally, because even using things like red yeast rice, 
the a natural statin uh, is not necessarily a good idea. Lowering your cholesterol with high doses of niacin, vitamin B3, is not necessarily a good idea depending on the premise that you're coming from. Now, there are exceptions to every rule, but but that being said, there's a, for example, there's a condition known as hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipoproteinemia, which some people have cholesterol shooting well up over three, 400. And, and really, these people may be at greater risk, but really it depends on their smaller particles of cholesterol. So most doctors, when they're measuring cholesterol, measure what's called HDL, LDL, and total cholesterol, which total cholesterol is a combination of your HDL and your LDL. And so based on those numbers, the decision as to whether to medicate or not to medicate is, is based without looking at the smaller particles of cholesterol. And what I want you to understand is you have large buoyant types of cholesterol that are, that are less of a risk as it relates to cardiovascular disease. And then you have smaller, less buoyant, uh, more, more uh, inflammatory, potentially inflammatory types of cholesterol, although technically cholesterol is not inflammatory at all. Cholesterol actually helps to um, put out inflammatory fires. And the smaller the cholesterol, the lower the density of the cholesterol, the, f- the closer it floats to the periphery of your blood vessel. So if, you're, you know, if your blood vessel is, is, a, is, a, is a cylinder shape, right, the smaller the cholesterol, those smaller molecules float closer to the periphery. So if you've got an inflamed blood vessel, let's say that part of your blood vessel is inflamed, that cholesterol actually serves as a, as a engine or as a tool to help try to put out the inflammation, to put out the fire. So that plaque, that cholesterol plaque is, la- is laid down as a result of a mechanism. Your body's just trying to stomp out the inflammation. It's trying to, to help you. And so that cholesterol is not really to blame for the heart disease. The cholesterol is just trying to put out the fire of the inflammation. So if you don't figure out where the inflammation is coming from, that's really where you end up with a problem because you're, you're really, you're, you're, Inflammation is where the root cause of cardiovascular disease comes from, not high cholesterol. High cholesterol can create a plaque only if you have pre-existing inflammation to a high enough level where your body responds to that inflammation by trying to protect you and protect your blood vessels by laying down those cholesterol plaques in your arteries. So the bigger question becomes if you've struggled with, with high cholesterol and your doctor's trying to lower it, Uh, The next question is, well, I don't really, you know, should we lower it or should we actually look for a source of inflammation to see whether or not I might even at risk for this issue? And if I have inflammation, then what's creating that inflammation and what can I do to address the inflammation as opposed to suppressing a chemical that's so important as it's necessary to create brain synapses, vitamin D, CoQ10, fight viruses, fight bacteria, uh, deliver antioxidants to your body as well as to produce all of your sex steroids. Like we just don't want to aggressively go after those important functions without true cause and true risk. Now, I'm gonna talk about something else that very few people talk about tonight and that, that's something called NNT value. And NNT value, NNT stands for numbers needed to treat. So when we're talking about cholesterol, NNT, numbers needed to treat. What does that really mean? This is actually a, a, um, a pharmaceutical statistic that has to be developed on a drug before it can be passed uh, by the FDA. And what, what, it, what it means, what an NNT value is, I'm going to give you what the statins. So statins, that's your Lipitor, your Crestor, your Zocor, your, your primary statins have an NNT value of 100. So what that means, let's talk about what that means. An NNT value of 100 means that for one person to receive a benefit from being on that medication, 99 people plus that one person have to be prescribed that medication. So for one person to receive benefit, 100 people have to actually be prescribed the medication. What that really states is that the efficacy of the medication is 1%, meaning we sacrifice 99% for the sake of that one person who might receive some benefit from having their cholesterol lowered and we, we don't have to do that. In essence, why that's happening is because doctors are prescribing cholesterol-lowering medications without looking for underlying reasons why inflammation is there in the first place, or they're, or they're prescribing it as a, as, a, as a catch-all means to try to reduce cardiovascular disease. I've seen doctors prescribe cholesterol medications even when cholesterol is not high, um, meaning they, they, you know, they're starting to put people on statins when their cholesterol is in the upper 100s, 190s. 
because then maybe that person has diabetes or maybe that person has high blood pressure. So the doctor's just being more aggressive at, as going after their cholesterol just because when there's no sound reason to do it, but it happens all the time. So again, NNT value, the NNT value for statins is 100, meaning for one person to receive the benefit of the medication, 100 people have to be prescribed the medication. Are you willing to be the 99 that become damaged? And how, did, how then do you discern whether you're one of those 99 that become damaged? Well, one of the ways you do that is you can ask your doctor for um, for a more detailed cholesterol test where they're actually looking, where he's actually looking at subparticles, things like remnant lipoproteins and apolipoprotein A and lipoprotein A and lipoprotein, apolipoprotein B. So these are some of the smaller particles of cholesterol that, get, that can pose a certain risk if you are inflamed. But one of the other things, so some of the other tests that you can have your doctor measure, one's called C-reactive protein, but specifically not just generic CRP or C-reactive protein, but HSCRP, HSCRP, HS stands for high sensitivity. So that's the test that's more specific for cardiovascular inflammation. So running that test can be a valuable tool to measure vascular inflammation to see if whether or not you're even at risk, you know, for this whole uh, cholesterol issue creating a plaque in your arterial walls. One of the other things that you can do, and I, I would, you know, if, 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 if you were in my office, what I would, what I would say is go back to your doctor and demand that they run a type of test called a Doppler um, of your, of your arteries, of your carotid arteries, where they can actually measure the thickening or the potential for placking within the carotid artery, the thickness of the carotid artery or the patency of that artery can be measured through Doppler or ultrasound. And that, that type of technology allows to, sh it, it can show you whether or not you actually have placking or whether or not you have occlusion of the vascular or of the vascular lining so that, so that again, if you are at risk, you can know it, you can know how to make an intelligent decision on how to proceed. Because if you've got clearly patent vertebral arteries and carotid arteries, and there's no major uh, placking within them at all, then lower your cholesterol is not going to reduce the lack of placking that you don't have. So again, you've got to, you've got to approach this from a common sense, intelligent way. So don't just blindly take cholesterol medication. If number one, you haven't run a, a smaller subtype, it is, some doctors will call these VAP tests. Some doctors will call these cardiolipid panels. Uh, there are a number of different labs that can run these smaller cholesterol particulate to actually help you ascertain the risk, your actual risk versus just your, whether or not your cholesterol is a little bit high and make sure that when you're getting your blood work done, that you're not getting your blood work done when you're sick, when you have a cold or a flu or when you have an infection. Uh, and if you're suffering with chronic autoimmunity and you're struggling from a chronic infection, like a yeast overgrowth or, you know, a chronic bacterial gastrointestinal infection of some, of something along those lines, you definitely want to wait until you beat that first before you make a decision about lowering your cholesterol. Because again, cholesterol can go up to help your body fight infection. And you don't want to disarm your body's mechanism of helping you fight by lowering your cholesterol artificially while simultaneously lowering your capacity to produce sex steroids, lowering your capacity to generate vitamin D and CoQ10, and reducing your capacity for production of neural synapses. So again, an intelligent approach, have your doctor, have your doctor run a, a ultrasound or Doppler test measuring patency of your arteries, have uh, your levels for inflammation checked. You can have a particle count done on your cholesterol to see what risk you actually have. And even more importantly, understand that, and, you know, again, and I'm, and I'm giving you information. If you want to read more in, into this, there's a lot of really great references. One is a book called The Cholesterol Myth written by a cardiologist by the name of Sinatra. It's a great book if you want to get more details about this information. Another great book that you can get more details about this information is No Grain, No Pain. So those of you who are new to the Dr. Osborne show, um, No Grain, No Pain is, is the my national be international best-selling book. And uh, I wrote and talked extensively about cholesterol and the cholesterol myth and that as well. So you can get more information from those two resources if you want to read more. Now, I wanna show you next, and I'm gonna put up this image for you because I think it's important that you understand some of the mechanisms of why cholesterol drugs don't actually work, why that NNT value is 100 instead of 
let's just say one or 10. Again, remember NNT value is, is, is basically it, it's measuring the efficacy of a drug. An NNT value of 100 means that 100 people have to be put on the drug for one person to receive benefit from the drug. We don't, the higher the NNT value, the worse the drug works. So with, with statin drugs being an NNT value of 100, you understand that this diagram, why I'm saying cholesterol drugs don't work. So number one, okay, is, is cholesterol lowering drugs cause CoQ10 deficiency. Now, if you follow the, the line in the air, the CoQ10 deficiency increases blood pressure. And this can actually also um, increase um, when your blood pressure is increased, this can actually increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, which again, is what the doctor's trying not to do. Now, the other thing CoQ10 deficiency can cause is muscle and nerve damage. It's actually highly linked to neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. Now, why is this a, a bad thing? Because a lot of people that are on statins that are lowering that, that are having their cholesterol lowered are also diabetic. So they're diabetic. And so they can be on a statin medication and this, if the statin medication is causing peripheral neuropathy, they think it's the diabetes creating the neuropathy, not the medication. So then nobody ever asks the question about whether or not the medication is creating the issue. And so then nobody ever really looks for the complication behind the medication. So it's important that you understand that if you're taking one of these meds and it's causing CoQ10 deficiency long enough, one of the outcomes is muscle and nerve damage. One of the outcomes of, of nerve damage is neuropathy. And again, that's the same kind of neuropathy that can be created as, as a diabetic neuropathy. The muscle damage component leads to muscle pain, and that can lead to fatigue and exercise aversion. Now, the problem with fatigue and exercise aversion, if you follow the diagram, if you go up the scale, exercise aversion leads to increased blood pressure, but also can lead to increased cholesterol. So now we're not winning. Again, we're losing the war. Whereas the fatigue and exercise aversion can also lead to weight gain and increased blood sugar which increases the risk of diabetes, which increases the risk of being on a diabetic medication. And also understand that your most common diabetic medications actually also cause CoQ10 deficiency, going back again to what CoQ10 deficiency causes, which is an increase in blood pressure, as well as congestive heart failure. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Now, diabetic medications also cause vitamin B12 and folate deficiency, which can cause fatigue and exercise aversion. So again, now we've got two medications in this cycle that are creating the, the, a similar type of outcome and scenario of fatigue, of lack of exercise, of increased pain. And so when a person stops exercising and they're in a lot of pain, now they generally will tend to gravitate toward pain medications. And most of those can cause leaky gut and can cause, uh, many of them can cause stomach ulceration. If you get really a lot of pain and get on the steroids, now you're causing uh, you're, ca you're causing vascular breakdown because the proteins that go into building your blood vessels and the proteins that go into building your muscles, over time, they're affected by long-term steroid use. And that, again, that weakens them. And that's why long-term steroid use is, is linked to muscle loss. That's why it's also linked to bone loss and it's linked to vascular deterioration. So you can see the cycles that will be set up when you just blindly take these medications and you don't ask some of these other really intelligent questions and have a meaningful conversation with your doctor about it. So again, my advice is if you have gone to the doctor and they measured that your cholesterol is high, if it's not higher than 250, um, you know, that's not something I would even really relatively be concerned with as long as you don't have high levels of inflammation or pre-existing inflammatory disease. Where that, where that cholesterol could become a problem. So again, the, the, it's not the cholesterol that you want to attack. It's the inflammation that you want to discover where the root cause of the inflammation is because cholesterol in this whole game is really an innocent bystander. It's, it's been demonized. It's been bastardized. Like I said earlier, it's kind of the redheaded stepchild of the medical world. Every doctor in the world wants to obliterate your cholesterol without thinking about how important your cholesterol is so I, I think it's important to understand those things so that you can make, again, an intelligent decision or at least have an intelligent conversation with your doctor before you just blindly get on that statin train and start railroading your cholesterol down low. Now, somebody's asking, how does low cholesterol affect someone uh, in several different ways? And so, again, going back to what low, for men, low, low cholesterol, low cholesterol can actually cause testosterone deficiency. Testosterone deficiency can 
reduce libido in men. It can reduce muscle mass. It can reduce energy. It can cause depression. It can lead to hair loss. There are a lot of different problems associated with, with, uh, with lower testosterone induced as a result of cholesterol suppression below the level of around 150. So again, these doctors, I've, I've actually heard people come to see me and I've actually, they've told me that their cardiologist or their, or their internal doc or their GP wanted their cholesterol at zero, meaning they were pushing for zero, which is absolutely stunningly ridiculous that any man of science or woman of science would have that statement for somebody uh, as it related to cholesterol. It just, it just shows how um, dogmatic the belief that lowering cholesterol is the right thing to do. If, if, if you know, understand that I'm, I'm, I'm a very scientific and objective person and that we have to look not only at the research um, and where the research is being funded and who's funding the research, but more importantly, we have to look at the empirical outcomes. And what, is, what do I mean when I say empirical outcome? We have now more than 35 years of the use of statins aggressively to lower cholesterol, but we have not had an impact of overall cardiovascular disease. We have not had an impact of overall reduced risk of, of heart disease deaths. In essence, we have more heart disease deaths than we had 35 years ago, a lot more, even though we have this aggressive approach at lowering cholesterol. Now, that being said, I don't think we can just blame doctors for prescribing cholesterol medications. If, if, you know, if you're struggling with cardiovascular disease, it's because you're making poor decisions in your diet and your lifestyle. So you have to own it too. You can't just blame the doctor for wanting to write a script. You have to own your diet. You have to own your lifestyle. You have to get out there and do the work. Because if you're not doing your job, that's generally what happens is people that don't do their job end up in the doctor's office. The doctor knows that the person's not going to do their job. And so they're just trying to make the best recommendation that they can. And, and, and that generally comes down to a statin because they, they see the reality of the situation, which is most people are not going to change their diet or their lifestyle. So again, don't, you can't really go and just blame the doctors either. You've really got a number one thing you can do is look in the mirror and ask the tough questions and get really brutally honest with yourself. What are you doing or what are you not doing that improves your outcome or that reduces your risk of an outcome of a cardiovascular event or a heart attack or stroke, et cetera. So you've got to take, you know, you've got to take credit where credit is due and, and, and take ownership over what you're doing or what you're not doing. I think that's super important. So again, back to that question, how does low cholesterol affect someone? That's, I gave you examples for men, for women, it can do very similar things. I've seen a lot of women develop progesterone deficiency over very low cholesterol. And again, progesterone deficiency, some of the symptoms of progesterone deficiency, heightened anxiety, sleep disruption, hot flashes, increased risk for certain types of cancer when estrogen and progesterone in, are imbalanced too much or estrogen dominance can increase the risk for breast cancer, can increase the risk for cervical cancer. So again, it, a low, too, too low of a cholesterol isn't good either. So again, the body needs cholesterol. As, I, as I've already laid, I laid it out in the first 15, 20 minutes of tonight's show. You know, again, for those of you who are just coming in or just tuning in, cholesterol makes all your sex steroids. Cholesterol produces vitamin D. It's a precursor to vitamin D. It's a precursor to coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10, which is necessary for your mitochondria to function and generate energy. That's why people that are on statins oftentimes are very tired and their muscles wear out too quickly. Cholesterol helps fight infections, viral, bacterial, fungal. Cholesterol is necessary for brain cells to form synapses between each other. So again, I know I'm being redundant there, but I think it, it, redundancy is necessary to drive the message home that cholesterol is not the bad guy and that attacking cholesterol has really been quite wrong. And if we, again, if we look at the empirical data of how has lowering cholesterol reduced people dying from heart attack and stroke, it hasn't. We have more people today dying from these diseases than we've ever had in the history of industrialized and modern America and really modern civilizations or countries across the globe. And, uh, and, and so the outcomes have to speak for themselves, right? Outcomes-based medicine means not just relying on the study that the drug rep came in and gave your doctor and said, look, our statin drug reduces the risk of developing heart disease by X percent. Therefore, you should give it to your patients. Who funded the study? Who paid for the study? Were there other studies done that weren't published? Because as a matter of fact, we know that that's a very common practice in pharmacy today is that a number, uh, a number of these big companies will fund a number of research studies and they'll only take the studies that show benefit and publish those studies. But the studies that show detriment or no benefit at all generally get swept under the rug and don't get published. And that, that's a very, very common practice 
in medical reporting and in medical journals today. And as a matter of fact, it, it, I can't remember how long ago, I think I don't quote me on this, but I think 10 or 15 years ago, the editors of both the New England Journal of Medicine and Journal of American Medical Association both came out and said, uh, both came out and actually resigned because they, they knew that they couldn't keep the bias out of the research and that it was such a huge problem. So it's, you know, don't take my word for it. If you want to look that up, you can, you can do a Google search on, on that very topic and you'll find more in detail about what actually, how that actually went down. Let's see here. So let's see, Susie's asking, is cholesterol connected to high blood sugar in any way? Um, directly or indirectly. So, you know, indirectly, yes, it can be, and it, but it doesn't have to be. Again, I, you know, all of you who are listening and this may, I mean, again, I might be just completely like turning some of you off tonight, or I might be completely blowing some of your minds tonight. I don't know. And maybe some of you already knew this and this is just repeat information, but cholesterol is not bad. And so I, I'm not a fan of going after high cholesterol. And I don't think that high cholesterol should be treated regardless. I think generally when your body has, finds an, a reason to produce that much cholesterol, your body is smarter than any doctor. And your body is generally either producing that cholesterol for a very good reason, or your diet is so poor and, 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 and so so conducive to the wrong types of foods that your body is producing that cholesterol as a mechanism to protect you from the food that you're eating. And I see this a lot with gluten sensitivity. I see it a lot in people with chronic infection. I see it a lot in people that have chronic illness is that their body's actually producing more cholesterol in an attempt to carry more antioxidants through their system uh, to help them or in an attempt to fight the infection. So again, suppressing that mechanism doesn't serve to help the person it only serves to lower the number. And again, it's the number uh, that doctors are hell bent on chasing when in reality, the number doesn't really change the empirical outcome of whether or not a person is going to have that illness. So again, going back to is cholesterol even, even bad or is, is it even something that people should consider lowering? I'm of the opinion that 90% of the cases, no, cholesterol should be completely left alone. And if you really want to reduce your risk for heart disease, you've got to look at food You've got to look at environmental chemicals and pollutants. You've got to look at things like heavy metals. You've got to look for things that are infectious or you've got to, you know, rule out infectious microorganism, things of that nature that can cause vascular inflammation that can increase the risk for the development of that inflammatory process that contributes to vascular or cardiovascular disease. So you've got to look for the reasons that those things can happen. And, and of course, those were what I just listed were biochemical reasons, but then there are also um, emotional reasons. There are people that are under a lot of stress. Stress can create inflammation just as much as eating the wrong food can. Probably, though, one of the biggest foods I see people commonly eat that will drive cholesterol outside of gluten is hydrogenated fat. So hydrogenated oils like your trans fats. And, and again, I'm talking about man-made vegetable oils that are, have hydrogen forced into them using a nickel catalyst. So on a food label, when you see the term hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fat, that's what we're referring to. Um, that's a big one. That will create a vascular in inflammation and simultaneously raise your cholesterol. Sugar is another one. Sugar is known to cause vascular inflammation and create a lot of problems. So you've got, you know, you've got to look at it in more, more than one way. You get, you've got to look at diet first. That's my opinion on the matter is that you don't go after cholesterol before you've looked at changing your diet to, to alleviate yourself from foods that are known causes of cardiovascular disease. And the, again, the, the big three, gluten or grain, the second one being sugar, the third one being hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats that again are man-made. So, you know, look at those first. And, and, uh, and again, I gave you some tests earlier, some names of different tests that you could have your doctor measure or order that um, that would be helpful for you to really get a good idea as to whether or not it's even a risk or really even an issue for you in the first place. Let's see here. Okay, I love this question from Kate. Can you get rid of the fatty deposits on your lids, on your eyes? She's talking about eyelids, these little fatty plaques called xanthelasmas. Um, 
that are created as a result of high cholesterol. Yeah, you can get rid of them. Your body can absorb them if you take care of uh, what's creating and what's triggering them. So absolutely, those can go away. I've seen those go away. But you've got to be very, very committed, Kate, to to your diet. You can't um, you can't just hope for the best and and hope that they go away. You've got to really approach your diet targeted and, and aggressively. Uh, let's see here, Tori. I got rid of my doctors over statins. All they did was hurt my kidneys. Had to go to a naturopath to get them back up. Yeah, I mean that's one of the side effects of statins is kidney damage. I said I mentioned that earlier. Thanks for thanks for sharing your story, Tori, with with the rest of the audience. Uh, because I, I, I really, and hey, let's just poll the audience tonight. How many of you have been put in a position where the doctor wanted you to be on a statin and, and you felt better? So I'm going to give everybody a couple of minutes. If you've been in that position, I'd just like you to, to chime in and share that, you know, with the audience so that we can kind of get a feel for, you know, just how potentially common that is. And I'll, I'll answer a few questions while those of you who are, um, have had that experience chime in. Uh, Maxine's asking, if you take a supplement of CoQ10, will it inhibit your body from producing it? And the answer to that is no, it will not inhibit your body from producing it. We eat CoQ10. We, we can eat CoQ10 as well. Our body can produce it. We can also get it from select foods. Um, so, so CoQ10 intake does not stop our body from producing CoQ10. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Yeah. So Kim's Kim saying that following an open heart surgery, her husband, uh, was prescribed a statin for the rest of his life. He didn't even have high cholesterol before the surgery. This just shows you the dogmatic and correct belief that many doctors have, which is I don't care if your cholesterol is high or not, we're going to lower it anyway, which is, a, I mean, it's a ridiculous notion. It's a ridiculous thought. And, um, you know, the reality is, is that giving him more statin is not going to reduce his risk of another heart attack. It's actually going to increase his risk of another heart attack through the many different mechanisms that we've been talking about tonight. Um, question coming in from Julia, how do you reduce LDL? Um, again, do you, the question isn't not, is not how do you reduce LDL? The question is, do you need to reduce LDL? Like that's the, really, that's the takeaway from tonight. It's not what you do to reduce your need, uh, your cholesterol, but, but is it in actuality something that you even need to consider? That's, that's, I'm hoping that you guys are grasping that from this conversation tonight, because again, reducing cholesterol might not be the right move. Remember, it's LDL that won a Nobel Prize. LDL is the one, it's the type of cholesterol, even though it's it's called the bad cholesterol, it's the type of cholesterol that helps your brain form synapses. As a matter of fact, low LDLs are linked to dementia. Look at how much Alzheimer's that we've seen over the last two decades as we've seen more and more statin use. Look at the association between statin use and the increased development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, we, we could draw a plot correlation showing that increased statin use has led to a concomitant increase and in increase in Alzheimer's diagnosis. Now, many people would say, well, you, that's causation and correlation. Correlation are not the same thing. And they're right. Causation and correlation are not the same thing. But that doesn't mean we throw common sense out with bathwater. That doesn't mean that we just blindly go after our cholesterol without just cause or, 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 or without concern for the consequence of, of blindly going after it. So let's see here. So Lucy's, my 12 year old son has gluten sensitivity and his doctor said his cholesterol was extremely high. So again, it depends on the definition of what your doctor considers to be extremely high. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people, uh, or a lot of doctors rather, I've seen doctors call 205 extremely high cholesterol when in actuality, it's very, very normal and very fine cholesterol level. So, um, clarity on that. Yeah. So Maria, just for clarity, she's saying, thanks for this info. So you mentioned the good level of cholesterol would be up to 250. That would be for the total cholesterol, right? Yes. But what would be good levels for HDL and LDL cholesterol? So 
the, the big issue is as long as your HDL really, I mean, if you're talking about again, and I don't, again, I don't even like to get into this because what is a good level of HDL and LDL? It depends because you could be making more LDL specifically to fight infection or specifically to form more brain synapses. And you could, you could be catching your blood at the right moment in time where LDLs appear to be higher. So we get into this whole game of counting cholesterol. We, I think we really end up losing. I think more specifically before you make 250 is a good kind of number to, to, to base it on. But I think as you move forward in the future, it's really looking at that number and monitoring it for consistency. Because where you where people can get into trouble is let's just say that, you know, for their whole life, their cholesterol was riding 200. And then all of a sudden, boom, 250. That that tells us there's something going on. There's some kind of biochemical process going on underlying that has led to the body wanting to make more of that cholesterol. And again, where, we'll, where we sometimes will see this is women going through menopause, their cholesterol levels will go up. One of the reasons why is hormone levels are dropping. Cholesterol levels come up to try to produce those hormone levels in, in, as a response. So again, we, we I'm going to use the term, even though it's not a technical term, but I like it. I made it up. It's called diseaseify. We don't want to diseaseify cholesterol just for the sake of diseaseifying cholesterol. So again, let's not get bogged down in what numbers are correct. Although if you really want some numbers, you know, LDLs at, at 150, if, you're, if your total's 250 and your HDL's at 100 and your LDL's at 150, that's perfectly fine. Now, if your LDLs are 200 and your HDL's way down at 50, there are probably some strategies and exercise and diet that you could take that would better optimize your cholesterol. But again, if it depends on when you took it, because if there was an underlying existing situation that when you went to your doctor to get your cholesterol measured, they showed that you had, you know, that, that where maybe you had, again, that, that chronic underlying infection, or, or maybe you had a, a hormone deficit and your body was responding, or maybe your brain was trying to repair synapses. So you're producing more cholesterol in an attempt to get that cholesterol to your brain to do that job. You know, again, we, we don't want to just look at cholesterol and HDL and LDL and make decisions, massive, big decisions, lifelong decisions with just one piece of data. It's again, check it periodically. I, I recommend doing it. You know, if you never get your blood work done, start with kind of an annual check or really if you want to get more aggressive, you can check it every three to four months for a year and you can have three or four data points and see where it's kind of sitting and where it kind of falls. Okay, hopefully I answered that question. Okay, let's see here. Bridget, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. You are appreciated. Thank you, Bridget. That uh, that makes my evening. I, I always like appreciation, so thank you for chiming in. Let's see. So Justin went whole food plant-based and it changed his life. Um, what I, where I would really caution on that is, you know, many of you can do that. Some of you are genetically designed for more of a vegetarian plant-based diet and many of you are not. And so it's important to get that delineation because I see far too many vegetarians who go vegetarian or go vegan or go whole plant-based and end up with heart disease or end up with dementia or end up with memory issues because the diet does not suit them genetically. So again, it's, it's not one of those things that Justin, I'm glad it helped you and, and, um, and it may have helped others of you out there. I don't doubt that, but you really have to have to dial in whether that's the right diet for you. Uh, more than just following it genetic generically. So, okay, I like this question too. Um, I hope I pronounced your name right. Weislaw Rocky, an important exception, are people with established cardiovascular disease? So, you know, this is what a lot of doctors will tell you is that somebody with an, you know, with a prior heart attack or somebody with an established cardiovascular disease should be on a statin regardless because of their past history. And that's false. Um, that's extremely false as a matter of fact, because really the fundamental question that needs to be asked is why did the cardiovascular disease occur in the first place? What is cardiovascular disease? It's kind of a generic broad spectrum phrase, cardiovascular, somewhere in your heart or somewhere in your vascular tree, you have a disease process that's, that's basically entrenched in inflammation, meaning the fundamental root reason that it, that the breakdown and the problem is occurring is because of an inflammatory problem. So the question is, what is creating that inflammatory problem? 
Cholesterol does not cause inflammation. So cholesterol cannot be the cause of cardiovascular disease. Cholesterol can only respond to the inflammation. That's where the plaque comes from. Remember the vascular wall becomes damaged and the cholesterol that's in the bloodstream that's floating in the bloodstream tries to do its job to lay a plaque or to lay a, a protective bandage, if you will, over that inflammatory damage. Cholesterol didn't cause the problem. Cholesterol is responding to the problem. Lowering the cholesterol doesn't reduce the risk because it doesn't address the underlying root reason the problem exists. It's for the same reason. Look, a lot of doctors, when somebody has high blood pressure, doctors will give blood pressure medications. The blood pressure medication doesn't fix the problem. It masks the problem. And this is, again, this is fundamental. You want to understand that masking the problem doesn't solve the problem. It only creates more problems. It's, it's kind of like when the tire is flat, if you, if you don't fix the tire or replace the flat and you, and you um, keep driving on it, but you, you put like a fix-a-flat can in your tire, you've still got a problem. You've still got the potential for a blowout. You've still got a major issue. And that's what that drug does. That drug just kind of reduces your risk temporarily while allowing you to continue to make bad decisions and the same mistakes in your diet and in your lifestyle. So it's very important that you address your diet and your lifestyle as the primary, not as the secondary. And so many doctors will tell you, look, take the statin and, and eat right and eat a balanced diet and exercise. What does that mean, eat a balanced diet and exercise? Because a balanced diet doesn't mean the same thing for Mrs. Jones as it does for Mr. Jones. A balanced diet you know, who, who's balanced diet? The American Heart Association balanced diet? Because that diet promotes cardiac inflammation. So what diet are we talking about, which is balanced? What are the specifics of a balanced diet? What are the specifics of exercise? Because some people don't tolerate high intensity exercise very well. So if you put them in a scenario where they're running sprints and doing super high intense calisthenics, you might actually increase their cardiovascular inflammation. Um, where in some people, yoga is a better form of exercise. And some people, uh, you know, different people respond differently. So what does balanced diet and exercise really mean? That's where doctors are failing. They're failing to get specific with the individual that's standing across the desk from them. So it's very, very important that we get specific. And, and again, that's why we don't just want to attack cholesterol. We can't just attack cholesterol because again, if, if we, um, if we do, we're going to pay the price. As a matter of fact, we're already paying the price. Uh, here's a story. Cass is saying, my mom ended up with Parkinson's and dementia due to being prescribed 40 milligrams of Lipitor statin, uh, a statin for years. I believe it. I've seen cases of Parkinsonian uh, induced tremors in statin use. Uh, here's another one. Deborah says, doctor pushed statins. I refused. Doctor fired me as a patient. Good for you, Deborah. <laughs> that was probably a, a gift in disguise. Let's see here. Yeah, a lot of you just chiming in based on that question. Uh, let's see here. Karen says, statins increase my muscle enzymes very high, cannot take them any longer. Um, I mean, you know, honestly, think about it. Statins, if you're on them, you should, you know, your doctor says that they want to check your liver enzymes every six months. Why would taking the liver poison somehow improve your health? Just from that very premise alone, that should that should really spark a great conversation of intelligent back and forth as opposed to kind of a dogmatic take this drug or you're not my patient anymore any doctor who gives you an ultimatum like that you know honestly you're probably better off if you find somebody who will have that conversation with you so marianne is asking if you're over the age of 50 is there special coq10 you take versus someone who's early 30s is there age difference uh would it be a capsule liquid no i mean really the coq10 you big one all is one of the best, most bioavailable bio forms of CoQ10. So, you know, you have to, you, 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 I wouldn't take powdered CoQ10. I would look for, I would look for a liquid gel um, or something in an oil base because CoQ10 is fat soluble and you want something that's pre-emulsified so that you can absorb it well, especially those of you maybe who have a gallbladder issue, got your gallbladder out. And, um, and you, and you, you understand that CoQ10 is a fat soluble nutrient and that makes it harder. If your gallbladder is out, it makes it harder for you to absorb fat. So taking a pre-emulsified CoQ10 supplement would be um, most effective. So Debbie's chiming in. My, my mom had high cholesterol or had cholesterol of 129 and they had her on Crestor 
Not surprisingly, she developed congestive heart failure. Alzheimer's and her diabetes was very difficult to control because of the statins. Just another, another story. Here's another one, Ember. My mother was put on a statin. She had a horrid side effect. Her skin peeled off the palms of her hands. She watched her, she watches her diet. However, now at 82, she does have Alzheimer's. Um, I like this question too. What should your triglycerides be? Um, shoot for 75. If your triglycerides are less than 75, 75 or less. So, you know, most labs now today report normal as up to as high as 150. Um, under 75 is really quite ideal. And you're asking that if your cholesterol at 300 is too high, that question is very dependent on, you know, on those other markers as well. So again, I would get with your doctor and have them, have them uh, really look at that. And, and I see your follow up to that, which is yes, you take steroids and yes, steroids can raise cholesterol. So again, anytime a doctor says, oh, you have high cholesterol and you're taking steroids, you want to make sure they know that. And that you have that that part of the conversation with them as well. Um, high fibrinogen, I like that question too, Julia. High fibrinogen, yeah, they, it sh, you know maybe it should be addressed, but how do you address high fibrinogen? High fibrinogen, it's basically it's increased platelet clotting or activity within the bloodstream that makes the blood viscosity or the blood thickness sticky. And one of the biggest causes for fibrinogen levels being too high is magnesium deficiency. Uh, Omega three fatty acid deficiency can cause that. So I would look toward dietary nutritional deficit as being the result of an increased platelet aggregation and fibrinogen activity within the blood. Uh, good question. Let's see here. I refused statins. Doctor overcharged me. <laughs> Need I say more? Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just trying to get through these. A lot of these are comments that I'm. I'm just trying to get through to the questions. Um. So Marsh is asking, can you just stop taking your statin? Look. Big medical disclaimer here, Marsha. You know, I'm not your doctor. I can't tell you to quit taking your statin. If you were my daughter, I would have you stop taking your statin immediately. But you're not my daughter, and I can't give you that advice legally, right? So, again, disclaimer. I think maybe I should answer it this way. Um, is there danger? Is there immediate life-threatening danger by stopping a statin immediately? The answer is no. Um now, if you're on a blood pressure medication, if you're on a diabetic medication, if you're on certain other kinds of medications, yes, there can be. Like if you're controlling your blood pressure from malignant hypertension and you just cold turkey quit your medicine, your blood pressure spikes, that's a problem. But as far as cholesterol is concerned, there's no imminent, immediate, acute, life-threatening um, consequence of stopping a statin. Um, but again, you need to have that conversation with your doctor. And if your doctor is not willing to have that conversation with you, maybe you need to look for a doctor who, who can have that conversation with you and monitor you so that you're not creating a potential problem either. Um, Nancy's asking about red yeast rice. Look, I'm not a big fan of lowering cholesterol. So even with red yeast rice, I'm not a fan. I don't believe that cholesterol needs to be, again, we're all, we've all been indoctrinated into this false belief pattern. You know, even the honey nut Cheerios B is telling us lower your cholesterol with a sugary garbage cereal, right? I mean, it's, that's how ridiculous our, our culture has become around this whole cholesterol dogmatic belief. Start from the premise that cholesterol is not bad and work your way into the premise that inflammation is probably the reason for the risk and look to ascertain what the reasons for inflammation that you're not addressing, that you could be addressing or you should be addressing. That's the premise where I want you to walk away from this conversation tonight. I want you to go and have that conversation with your doctor. Let's see, Rhonda, she says, so I'm 33 healthy, normal weight, but my cholesterol has been borderline high for the past five years. My HDL was 69 a month ago. Is this something or should I be concerned about and how do I, or how can I lower it? I tried taking omegas and it didn't seem to help. I am adding flaxseed to my diet as well. Look, I don't know what borderline high means to you, Rhonda, so it's hard for me to, to give you an exact answer, but with most doctors, borderline high means that you're around 200. 
in the upper 190s. And that's not borderline high. That's mythically borderline high, but it's not really borderline high. Again, it's borderline high based on four doctors who made a decision to lower the numbers. Then that, and those four doctors were all being paid by the industry. And, I, and again, I can't, I can't accuse that panel of saying, yes, that the industry directly paid them to lower the numbers, to purposefully prescribe more statin drugs so that they could hurt everybody. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to take the, the, those numbers, those numbers that are being reported as high with a grain of salt because the numbers were created by doctors who were, who directly had financial ties to the industry. That's, we have to intelligently ask that question. And so, it, you know, it's the, it's the people who aren't willing to have that intelligent conversation with their doctor that become the victims of the statin abuse, because that's right now what we've got going on is major statin abuse in our country. Now, as far as trying to naturally, let's just not say lower your cholesterol, let's change the verbiage and let's just say to keep your cholesterol healthy, to keep your blood flow healthy. One of the things that you can do is you can eat lots of healthy omega-3 fatty acids. You can eat those through fish, you know, good fish, salmon, cod, mackerel, halibut, to, uh, not tilapia unless it's wild caught, but that's hard to get. That's rare. Um, but other fish like, uh, I think I mentioned mackerel, tuna, sardine, anchovy. Those are great sources of omega-3 if you're eating them in your diet. Um, and then some people will eat chia or flaxseed as an omega-3 source from a plant base. But really, to get your omega-3 levels up, you, you've got to get it from fatty fish. And, and again, omega-3 can also come in grass-fed beef, but not quite as high as it is in, 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 in wild-caught fish. And if you're doing supplementation, we're talking about concentrated doses of EPA and DHA. Um, you know, my, ideally, what, what I see work effectively in the people that come to see me is about three grams a day of concentrated EPA and DHA. Um, you may not have taken enough to have any kind of impact at all on your on your LDL, but but just so those of you listening know, EPA DHA combination has been shown to raise HDL, lower LDL, and lower triglycerides. It's it's one of the very few things in the world that can do all three of those, other than niacin. So niacin, which is vitamin B three, and fish oil can both. Both of those are natural essential nutrients that your body cannot function without. Those are your best two weapons. And, and again, not in lowering cholesterol, but in regulating and in keeping your, you know, your vascular markers healthy. Um, so, if, you know, if you're not eating fish like that, if you're not eating food like that, that's, you know, what I would encourage you to do. Uh, Melody's asking about low cholesterol. Again, I mentioned low cholesterol earlier and some of the symptoms associated with, with low cholesterol in both men and women. So, if you go back and watch the replay, you'll be able to pick up on those. How do you lower triglycerides? Best way to lower triglycerides is a diet change. Most people's triglycerides are high as a result of carbohydrate toxicity, not as a result of too much fat. Now, too much fat can cause elevations in triglycerides, but it's typically carbohydrates that causes it. Remember, your liver deals with excessive carbohydrates by converting them into triglycerides, and that's what will lower your serum triglyceride levels. So, most people eating 60, 70, 80% of their total caloric intake a day from carbohydrates end up having higher levels of triglycerides. Now, something else that causes elevations in triglycerides is liver damage. So look for things that could be potentiating liver damage. Again, that's why statins, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to me, the dogmatic belief that we have in our society that, that statins, which are liver toxins, which can cause liver damage, which can cause elevation in triglycerides, right? There's so many different ways that taking a statin long-term can increase your risk for heart disease. And, and yet people continue to do it without asking the question. So lowering triglycerides, number one, reduce your carbohydrates if you're over-carbing. Uh, number two, make sure you check your liver, make sure that your liver's not inflamed. Number three, exercise. Exercise. Triglycerides are oftentimes can be elevated in people who have sedentary lifestyles. Uh, Veronica, so my cholesterol was elevated four months postpartum after a reflux flare-up. I went to see the doctor and was found to have a hypothyroid. My doctor said high cholesterol 220 postpartum is normal. Why is that normal postpartum? Cholesterol is necessary for brain synapse formation. Your breast milk is rich in cholesterol and the baby needs it. So again, you know, um, 
I can't over or uh, I cannot overemphasize the importance of cholesterol for brain and cognitive health. And and again, just the fact that people are have demonized it for so long and gotten away with it blows my mind. Um, does CRP and cholesterol interrelate? Well, here's where they interrelate. Pamela, CRP is a marker for vascular inflammation. So if you've got vascular inflammation, so if your CRP is elevated and your cholesterol is high, particularly the smaller types of cholesterol, that's what increases the risk. It's, it's the combination of the two. It's not the cholesterol by itself because if the CRP were normal and there were no markers of vascular inflammation, the cholesterol really wouldn't be a great risk. So it's not that it's not that CRP and, and cholesterol interrelate in terms of that they're both markers for inflammation. It's that uh, elevations in cholesterol when there's an elevation in CRP or what can create the risk for developing a plaque inside your arteries. Oh, I love this. Thank you for sharing, Lucy. Uh, my 12 year old cholesterol was 201. Weight was okay per our pediatrician. After getting tested through your gluten gene test and testing positive for gluten sensitivity, we all went on a no grain diet. Within the first month, he stopped having acid reflux, chest pain, and joint pain gone. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. Well, you're welcome, Lucy. Thank you for sharing that story. I'm sure that's going to help other people who are listening in. So Marianne asks if I still make a, a gluten-free version of vitamin B3 and the answer is absolutely yes, I do. Um, it's, you know, those of you who, do, who don't know, again, many of you may be chiming in who are new. You can check us out online, glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you subscribe, get access to our gluten-free survival kit. Um, and those of you, especially if you're trying to learn the in, inroads to how to navigate the gluten-free diet. Um, but that's also one of our services that we provide. We provide genetic testing for gluten sensitivity when doctors don't want to order the test for people. And we provide a verifiable grain-free supplementation. Many supplements that claim to be gluten-free still contain other forms of gluten that can be confusing and misleading. And so that's part of our mission. Part of our mission is to be able to provide those healthy types of, of products for people who are just trying to navigate these waters and not take on damage from products that they can't trust. So you can go to glutenfreesociety.org to learn all about that. Yeah, so this is a good this is a good one. Regina is chiming in. She had a partial thyroidectomy in July. Then uh, her cholesterol has been rising since. Now it's 260, HDL is 60, LDL is 186, triglycerides 90, normal, sugar's normal, TSH free, T4 has been high. Due to wrong dose, 2.11, can high T4 free be a contributor? Well, I would say more than anything, Regina, the fact that the fact that you've got ulcerative colitis and Hashimoto's, that you've had a partial hysterectomy, is that you have unresolved autoimmune disease. You need to go get a copy of No Grain, No Pain and start following the diet protocol in that book, Chapter 7, Chapter 8. I would do that immediately because you've got unresolved inflammatory autoimmunity and none of these things are, are, are going to matter if your diet's not dialed in. And, uh, and that's where I would start. And you can also read chapter 10 because in chapter 10, I outline all the different functional tests that you can ask your doctor to order so that you can get the detailed information. A lot of times you'll hear me talking about specific types of tests and different things uh, during these, you know, during these sessions. And, and kind of, again, I outline what those are in chapter 10 and no grain, no pain as well. So as a follow-up reference, Highly recommend that you go check that book out. You can get it at the library if you can't afford it. You can buy it online. If you ha don't have an Audible account on Amazon, it's actually free. They'll actually give you a copy of No Grain, No Pain. Um, if you sign up for an Audible account, that you can choose that as your first free book, and they actually will give that to you. So a lot of people don't realize that we have that deal with, with Amazon because we want to get the information into people's hands. Okay. I don't see any more questions coming through and we're, you know, 15 minutes beyond the
the hour. So I went a little long tonight, but uh, you know, I felt like we needed to really dive into this topic. So again, those of you, if you're new to the Dr. Oz, pick Dr. Osborne's brain show, um, you can find all of our archives on Glutenology. That's youtube.com forward slash Glutenology. Make sure when you go there that you subscribe to our feed. That way you'll get updated about any new videos that I come out with because we come out with uh, a lot of videos on a weekly basis to help educate you about natural health and wellness. Uh, additionally, you can go to glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you sign up for a gluten-free survival kit. You can also visit us online at drpeterosborne.com if you want to learn more about our mission, about what we do at Origins Healthcare. And uh, make sure, please, do me a favor. This information is, is, is necessary. We need to get this information into the hands of more people. And the only way I can do that is is to have you help me. In essence, the more of you that are out there that are preaching, getting healthier, sharing your experiences, um, the more we're going to reach more lives, change more lives, save more lives. So help me do that. If you know somebody that would value that or that would benefit from this information, please, please, please share this with them. Share this video with them. Um, share Gluten-Free Society. Share my mission, my No Grain, No Pain mission with them, and let's get them at least going in the right direction. Thanks again for tuning in tonight. We'll be back regular show next week, Monday evening, 6 p.m. Every night, every week, 6 p.m. right here, the Pig Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. And if you're not subscribed to get these notices, make sure you go and do that. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.